I first started working for Farah, I came through Vice, and I started to do the Art Rocker Icon series, which was um, you know, basically rock and roll up and comers and upstarts wearing the Farah stuff. So I was thinking of Farah at the time, it was um, Farah from The Horrors, Gary Newman, Black Keys, um, The Maccabees, and Plan B as well. So I went on this little journey once every couple of months doing this Farrah Icons uh, work, which was great really, because it's very similar to the stuff I'd done when I worked for Sounds, similar sort of bands, back in the 80s. <laughs> And so I enjoyed that, and of course that led to Farah trusting me to do one of their campaigns that led on to me to do, um, I think, five or six campaigns now for them. It's funny, it means a lot to me now, obviously, because I've had a working relationship with them. When I was younger, in my mind, they were mod clothes. That's what mods were. We knew what Farah was. We knew it was part of, or I certainly knew being a skinhead, that it was part of that heritage. The biggest thing were the school trousers, with the stay press, really. But I still like the little, the, the label that it is, because it, it does seem very, it still seems very grassroots. Well, we, we wanted, for the lookbook, for the, the new 2014 collection, what we tried to do with the other um, campaigns was to, I wanted to originally have each part of London recognisable. And I sort of saturated that one, really. This one, I just wanted, I still wanted it to be London, but I wanted it a very bleak, clean background without being in the studio. And the South Bank National Film Theatre or National Theatre really supplied that. The lack of personality, again. Well, so it had a lot of very clean uh, walls, a lot of very clean backgrounds. <clears throat> so that's why that was used. And it was lovely to spend the day in there, just to have the, just, that's what's beautiful about photography is where you can, where you can get access to. So I had the run of the place for the day, the roof and, and the back. So I enjoyed that thoroughly actually. But the whole reason behind that and the inspiration was that was to actually give the clothes a chance. Because normally I'll try and get backgrounds in, I'll try and... Because if somebody's looking at it in New York, they'll never go to London, a lot of people. You know, that's glam like when I look at pictures of New York, it's glamorous to me. I try, I get a little bit corny actually in some of the shoes. I like the red telephone boxes. I like the stuff that, that symbolises where you are, you know, even though a lot of people sort of shy away from it. I get the phone call from the designer saying they're interested in the rave stuff, which to me is just fantastic. It's because it's always the old 80s skinhead work that mainly goes on, on clothing. And so, I didn't know what photographs they were going to choose. I just, you know, I just said, right, here's the rave collection. And I loved that. The first ones to have done that, to use my rave work. The, the privilege of it, to know that my work is used on, and, you know, is used on this stuff, it blows my mind, really, because I've done far all when it comes down to pushing myself as a photographer. Not, pff, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the, but I still get these opportunities, which is in a way is a bit crazy to me. So hopefully I'll be able to find the two they used. That's why, I, that's why I love giving a collection of my work when I get contacted about um, them being used for whatever. Because that became a total surprise to me. You know, so what will they use? Will it be good? And this is a combination of two pictures. One was at the end of the night in Slough Centre. My friends are in there. They're my friends Cyborg, Stuart. And there's my brother Neville, and my friend Nipper. Uh, there, yeah, there's my brother Neville there. So that makes it even more personal. And it was a combination of that and this. Which is, I was off my tits when I took the, I'm literally just wandering around going and, uh, and for them to end up on a piece of clothing, which I think will actually end up being some, some people's favorite piece of clothing. I think people, I would anyway. And um, it makes it even more important to me, really. Yeah, it was very important to me. I came to a, I came to a, a place where it's like, right, okay, I can live off this for the rest of my life and get adulation off this for the rest of my life and sit on my ass for the rest of my life and get stroked for being photographs I took when I was 15 to 18. Great, I could do that. But something inside my being was like, 
this is I've got to get this raid book out there. I needed it politically to sort of put a wedge between I was a skinhead, took photographs of skinheads, and then became a dustman, and that was that. I was, a, I was always a photographer first and foremost. And for the raving book to culture to be out there, it's changed a lot for me as a photographer. I'm no longer Mr. Skinhead, you know, because there's a whole lot of people. The greatest thing that I was waiting for for that was somebody to come up to me and go, I love your raving book. Oh, you've seen a Skinhead one. Oh, you've got a Skinhead one. I was like, yes, fucking yes. They didn't know that I had had a Skinhead book out there. I thought, yeah, if one person knows that, that's good for me. Not that I'm slagging it off, but it wasn't, that, that was a, a time that I came, that I clawed out of and to be constantly reminded of it and to have a year of my life that was 10 years of letting that go and that to, you know, for that to have us, to be out there as well, was really important to me. You know, I mean, it's not the biggest thing in the world, but it was important to me. You know, the other, that I was viewed out there as not just being, you know, this guy that could only photograph people with short hair. Totally. I just knew I was in a revolution. I just fucking knew it. Just knew it. Every, from the day I went to the, the first one, I was just like, this is a revolution. And it fucking was. The most unsung one this country's ever had. Because your gender couldn't tear them to pieces. With skinheads, anything working class, I can totally I just demonise you till the sun comes down. But with Ray, they couldn't do it. So it's been basically ignored, even though the reverberations of it have just changed the fucking world. And it's like it, because there was no twiggies, there was no sixes, there was no little band of, of people that represented that. It, it was across the board, from working class to the upper middle class, a shared experience that no class could, could own. Didn't last very long because you can't have 40k sound systems kicking off over the country, up and down the country forever. And, and, and so that changed, but for a year there, for a good year and a half, there was, there was anarchy. Like, good anarchy. Not the anarchy they try and force down your throat. It's, what happens with anarchy, like, smash, you know, crust is smashing up fucking the city. But real anarchy. I glimpsed that. I can fucking go to my grave knowing I glimpsed what that would be like. Well, in my eyes, music since the MTV era has become hand in hand with fashion, hasn't it? Whatever they did, they've psychologically found what makes somebody a skinhead, a biker, that deep tribal thing inside of you, and they marketed that with Adidas and Nike, and then that became the that's become the norm. So it's tough for bands if they want to be like crass and they really want to be anti-thing because a lot of these bands would not even get seen if it wasn't for the labels attaching themselves to them. But I think now it's, it's, it's a necessity really. It's become, they've become hand in hand, more so than it was when I was a kid. I don't have too strong a feelings about it, but I do think about it, obviously, because now I'm involved in the industry. I'm not stuck on the dole slagging everyone off anymore. <clears throat> now, if you'd have asked me 15 years ago when I was on the dole, I'd have been a mili militant and burn them all. Things change. I've sold out. I love all that sold out shit. It's like I never sold in. Sold in the what? I always want, I want a fucking wine cellar. I'm frustrated at aristocracy. I don't want to sit around going power to the people in a shit council estate on the fucking back and beyond. Can't say stop. Like, when did we ever sell in? Especially skinheads. I wasn't a crass fan. We were all Levi's. We were conservative. We wanted to better ourselves. Oh, you sold out. I don't really get that. I sold out to what? To who? What did I represent myself as saying? I'm going to be a fat skinhead forever, oy, oy. or a raver. we will still be doing it at 50, fucking nice. I'm always ranting and raving, I didn't want to do that today. If I ever thought about it, which I don't, I've always said one, one thing only, I want at least to have some sort of really realistic energy in them. I like energy and focus, if they're alive. I like to, the, the person to at least look alive. All the, Oh no, I can't stand all that crap. So I, one thing only, I don't think about it much, but I like to know that my photographs have a certain amount of beauty to them and a certain amount of life to them. You know what I mean? Then I'm happy. What inspires me when I have to get off my ass and go and do something, pick a camera up, look through it, take pictures. 
And that process of picking a camera up, until I do that, I'm just fucking, I don't really think about photography. And that's the truth, until I pick it up and then I, I get into the mode. And I think about not thinking about it. I think about what happens if I did start analysing it. You know, and start sitting there going, oh, that's the reason for this, that and the rest of it. No, I don't. It's very instant. When I'm taking photographs, what's in front of me and what's behind that subject is what I'm registering. I don't plan really. It's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't know. The giants, the people I could never even touch, like Ansel Adams and Karsh and those boys, you know. And I've always liked them ever since I was 16 because I knew I could never even get anywhere near or touch them. So the rest of them just are non-existent. I've got more friends now that are photographers than I used to have, but uh, I had such a hard time with it when I was younger that I just couldn't look at any other photographers. So that sort of set a precedence with me not sort of running around galleries and going, oh, they're good. They're all crap compared to me. <laughs> no, I literally had to literally not focused on anything other because my insecurity is bad enough as it was. I get, I get confused with the fact is I have all these clothes and I always end up wearing the same stuff. You know, I have to have those favours. I'm still very much from when I was 14 onwards. I like cords, I like t-shirts, I like these, I like, um, oh, this is my favourite piece of clothing is a bomber jacket, I think. It's one that's been consistent. So like most men, I'll, we keep it simple. You know, and it's still, I wouldn't say skinhead, but it's still very much that t-shirt, jeans, God love tracksuit bottoms, which I'll fester in. You know, I've become a lot more fashionable over the, <laughs> since I've been doing it, obviously. And that's what's get people give me nice clothes to wear. <laughs> but the one that pops out of my head is my mate, <clears throat> Skinny Jim on the tube with a fag and head out of his mouth. That's the one that popped into my head. It's such a mental image. And the one people seem to love is the kid with the owl. You know, they love that image. But um, with me, but at the moment, this moment in time, sat here, the one of Skinny Jim pops into my head. Just the thing, I took that when I was 15 and it's just such a phenomenal image.